Hello everyone, it's Eric from Strong Medicine, and today I'm discussing hypercoagulable states. By the end of the video, you will be able to describe the pathogenesis, clinical manifestations, and diagnosis of hypercoagulable states, and to determine which patients with thromboembolism should receive a hypercoag workup, and what tests that workup should include. Before diving into specific conditions, when discussing hypercoagulability, it's helpful to start with Birkhoff's triad, named after a German physician who was among the first to offer a modern description of thrombosis and embolism, though he does not appear to have described the triad in the terms we do today. Birkhoff's triad states that pathologic thrombosis is a consequence of either alterations in blood flow, that is stasis, endothelial injury, or alterations in the constituents of blood for example, abnormal levels of clotting or anti-clotting factors. Let's start with the inherited hypercoagulable states. And we will return one final time to the coagulation cascade. To remind you, in addition to the mostly numbered prothrombotic factors, there are also anti-thrombotic control mechanisms. These include protein C, which together with its cofactor protein S, inactivates factors 5 and 8, and antithrombin, which inactivates thrombin 7, 9, 10, and 11. From this, we can predict some inherited pathologies that could lead to an increased risk of pathologic coagulation. For example, deficiency of any of those three factors. There is also a relatively common, very specific mutation in the prothrombin gene in which there is a substitution of adenine for guanine at position 2210, hence this mutation being known as the G20210A mutation. Heterozygotes for this mutation have up to 30% higher concentration of circulating prothrombin via an unknown mechanism. The last significant inherited hypercoagulable state is called the Factor V Leiden mutation, named after the University of Leiden in the Netherlands, where it was first discovered in 1994. Factor V Leiden arises from a single point mutation which abolishes the cleavage site where activated protein C works to inactivate factor V. Among these five conditions, being a heterozygote for the factor V Leiden mutation or prothrombin mutation are the most common, but they also carry the lowest risk of thrombosis. The acquired hypercoagulable states are more diverse, and there are three notable specific diseases with an unusually strong predilection for causing thrombosis antiphospholipid syndrome, heparin-induced thrombocytopenia, and paroxysmal nocturnal hemoglobinuria. The antiphospholipid syndrome, also called antiphospholipid antibody syndrome, is composed of the combination of either recurrent thrombosis and or pregnancy morbidity, such as fetal loss and preeclampsia, plus the presence of at least one antibody that binds to phospholipids, of which there are three primary types, anti-cardiolipin antibodies, anti-beta-2 glycoprotein-1 antibodies, and one called lupus anticoagulant. About half of the cases of antiphospholipid syndrome are said to be primary, while the other half are associated with an autoimmune disease, most commonly lupus. Common manifestations include venous clots, such as deep vein thromboses and pulmonary emboli, arterial clots, such as strokes and TIAs, a skin condition called livido reticularis, and the aforementioned pregnancy complications. Among hypercoagulable states, antiphospholipid syndrome is the most likely to cause arterial clots in addition to venous ones, whereas the other states predominantly cause only venous clots. Commonly associated lab abnormalities include thrombocytopenia, hemolytic anemia, an elevated PTT, which does not correct with a mixing study, and low C3 and C4. That a prothrombotic state would be associated with an elevated PTT is a little counterintuitive, but this observation is speculated to be due to the antibodies binding to the phospholipids used in the PTT assay, so it's more or less a testing artifact that just happens to be diagnostically helpful. Heparin-induced thrombocytopenia was already covered in a previous hemostasis video on the specific topic of thrombocytopenia. 
However, since it's a significant cause of pathologic thrombosis, I'll take a minute to review it. There are two types of HIT, which aside from the fact they are both associated with heparin use, otherwise have nothing to do with one another. Type 1 is caused by non-immune mediated platelet aggregation with the onset of thrombocytopenia within two days, and it has very low clinical significance. It doesn't cause thrombosis, for example. Type 2 HIT is caused by antibodies to the complex of PF4 and heparin with an onset of 5 to 10 days after heparin initiation, though earlier onset is possible if the patient has been previously sensitized to heparin. The greatest risk from type 2 HIT is the development of thrombosis. Venous thrombosis is more common than arterial, but when it occurs, the latter is more likely to be devastating. Type 2 HIT is diagnosed based on the combination of a clinical prediction rule called the 4T score, an ELISA test for the antibodies, and one of several functional assays. Paroxysmal nocturnal hemoglobinuria is a rare condition caused by an acquired mutation within a multipotent hematopoietic stem cell. The clinical manifestations of PNH include a complement-mediated Coombs-negative intravascular hemolytic anemia, fatigue out of proportion to the anemia, bone marrow suppression, pulmonary hypertension, abdominal pain, and relevant for this video, venous thrombosis in unusual locations, such as the IVC, hepatic and portal veins, the dural venous sinuses of the brain, and the mesentery. It's the venous thrombosis that's the leading cause of death in patients with PNH. Despite its name, the classic presentation of paroxysms of hemolysis occurring at night is actually atypical for the disease. Diagnosis is confirmed via flow cytometry. In addition to the specific prothrombotic conditions discussed, there are many miscellaneous risk factors for venous thromboembolism, that is DVTs and PEs. These include surgery, particularly orthopedic, trauma, malignancy, particularly myeloproliferative neoplasms, hospitalization, immobilization, including prolonged travel, nephrotic syndrome, cirrhosis, inflammatory bowel disease, heart failure, pregnancy, obesity, hyperhomocysteinemia, and central venous catheters. There are also a number of medications that are associated with an increased risk of thrombosis, most notably oral contraceptives and hormone replacement therapy, erythropoietin, and the breast cancer treatment tamoxifen. There are a significant number of opinions and slightly disagreeing recommendations on the evaluation of hypercoag states but they all share the common features of recommending less workup than is typically done in practice. There are two primary reasons for this. First, even among patients with VTE who are found to have an inherited thrombophilia, most never have recurrent thrombosis. And second, the presence or absence of an inherited thrombophilia generally should not impact anticoagulation decisions in most cases. What I'm going to present here will represent just one such approach. It's not intended to be definitive. And keep in mind that all decisions regarding hypercoag workups should be tailored to the individual patient. First, for patients with arterial thromboembolism, such as a stroke or TIA, the first diagnostic step is to obtain cardiac rhythm monitoring, an echocardiogram, and vascular imaging. Only if those tests fail to identify an etiology should you consider looking for a hypercoag state, and even then, only testing for antiphospholipid syndrome, particularly in younger patients and in those with a history of prior VTE. This is because inherited thrombophilias are not a major risk factor for arterial thrombosis. For venous thromboembolism, such as a DVT or PE, the first question to ask is whether or not the clot was provoked. If provoked, for example, by surgery, trauma, active malignancy, or immobilization, the only workup that is typically indicated is age-appropriate cancer screening, which patients should get anyway, irrespective of the presence of a clot. A major reason to not test for thrombophilias after provoked VTEs are that patients who test positive for one may not be at a significantly increased risk of recurrent VTE compared to those who test negative. So while these would not be false positives per se, 
a positive test result could nevertheless expose the patient to unnecessarily long durations of anticoagulant therapy. On the other hand, if the clot was unprovoked, there are many more considerations that could impact workup. Everyone should get age-appropriate cancer screening, a CBC to screen for pre-existing anemia prior to initiation of anticoagulation, and as a very rudimentary screen for myeloproliferative disorders, a PTT to screen for APS, as well as von Willebrand disease, which could impact anticoagulation decisions. Some clinicians also get a chest X-ray as a relatively inexpensive, though insensitive way to screen for lung cancer. For patients who have recurrent unprovoked VTE, check for inherited thrombophilias and APS. If the clot is in an unusual location, in addition to inherited thrombophilias and APS, consider checking for paroxysmal nocturnal hemoglobinuria and myeloproliferative disorders. If the patient has a first-degree relative with a history of VTE at a young age, check for inherited thrombophilias. Keep in mind that patients who have a family history of VTE but a negative inherited thrombophilia workup still remain at an increased risk of recurrent VTE as compared to patients who lack a family history of VTE. This is presumably due to imperfect tests, as well as the existence of as-of-yet unidentified inherited thrombophilias. An unexplained high PTT should prompt an evaluation for APS. The concurrent presence of a Coombs-negative hemolytic anemia should prompt an evaluation for PNH. And anyone currently receiving heparin should have a 4T score calculated with further testing for HIT dependent upon that score. Layered on top of all of these considerations, however, is that any test should only be ordered if it will alter management. For example, if the patient would opt for lifelong anticoagulation after an unprovoked DVT, irrespective of the presence of an inherited thrombophilia, there is no major reason to check for one. If one decides to evaluate for a hypercoagulable state, there are some limitations to the testing, based on timing and concurrent therapy, which can either impact the levels of factors or can interfere with the assay itself. I won't read through this table in its entirety, but there are three major points here. The first is that because warfarin directly interferes with the post-translational modification of protein C and protein S, levels of those factors cannot be checked in someone who has recently been on warfarin. The second point is that genetic tests and ELISA tests for antiphospholipid antibodies can be checked at any time. And the third is that acute thrombosis can impact the reliability of anything other than genetic tests and ELISAs. Due to this last point, it's best to defer testing for an inherited thrombophilia or APS at the time the thrombosis is initially identified. Not only will deferring the testing allow for more accurate test results, it will also give the clinician more time to consider and discuss with the patient the risks and benefits of testing at all. I'll end this video by reviewing what the timing of hyperquag testing should look like following an unprovoked VTE. Following an unprovoked venous thrombus, start anticoagulation right away, assuming there's no absolute contraindications. And do age-appropriate cancer screening, CBC, plus or minus a chest x-ray. If there are features suggestive of cancer, PNH, or a myeloproliferative disorder, test for the relevant condition. If there are no suggestive features, or that testing is negative, continue anticoagulation for three months. At that point, Ask whether the presence versus absence of a defined hypercoagulable state will change management. If not, don't test for one and just continue or discontinue anticoagulation as per shared decision making with the patient. If it will make a difference, stop anticoagulation and wait at least two weeks for washout of the med and recovery of factor levels. At this point, you can test for the relevant inherited thrombophilias and or APS. Thanks for watching this video on hypercoagulable states. I hope you found it to be helpful. In the final two videos of this series on hemostasis, I'll be reviewing specific patient cases as a form of review and self-test.